I've got another cat episode for you. Yay! Where are all my cat people at? I am so excited to share today's episode with you. Laura Lee Medley has joined me from the dedicated feline enthusiast. And today we are talking about everything cat. It is absolutely incredible the conversations you get to have with people who just get you and understand you because we are both we have been cat people since pretty much the day we were born (laughs) and she is oh my goodness since we recorded this episode her certifications and what she is offering to customers and clients are is ex- expanding like crazy. I first met Laura Lee through the two crazy cat ladies who, uh, if you remember way back when, uh, have also joined me on the podcast. I will make sure to link that in the description below as well as everything you need to find Laura Lee because she is certainly a cat whisperer and doing all of the things to help you provide you great information uh, to help your cats. Make sure to check out the DFE.com, which stands for the Dedicated Feline Enthusiast. And let's get into today's episode with Laura Lee Medley. Have you tried training methods that just didn't work? Do you feel that your pet is not getting his or her nutritional needs met? Are illnesses and bad behavior your daily norm? You're going to want to join me on the Pet Parenting Reset, where you'll hear interesting and informative interviews and get solutions to all your pet problems. I'm your host, Jessica L. Fisher. So Laura Lee, tell me a little bit about you, how you got involved with cats. We'll get around to the dedicated feline enthusiast in just a little bit, but I want to hear a little bit about you first. Um, so I, I think I got my first cat when I was like two. Um, and I've just always, I have not, there's not been a day since then that I've not had at least one cat. It's just... It's just my thing. Um, Currently, I have 18 cats. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I didn't set out to find 18 cats, um, but it just kind of, it was the way it worked. Um, And it's just been like the more I've been learning, the better I'm doing for them. And it's just, you know. I'm constantly looking for new ways to mm-hmm. better their life. Um, and it's been a challenge, but, you know. For sure. Are all 18 indoor? Um, yes, in a way. So they're kind of broken up into three groups. Um, so we have the resident cats. And there's seven resident cats. Um, and then we have... A group, there's only five now, um, downstairs, and they were the Kraken Kitties. And I call them that because when we lived in our old house, when we opened up the door to the bonus room, it was like releasing the Kraken. (sighs) So they became the Kraken Kitties. And then I have a cat house outside that has six cats. And they were the colony that I was doing TNR on that the Kraken Kitties came from. Um, And so when we moved, we moved them here and I set them up in a cat house in the backyard. Wow. I think you might be the only other person I've ever met who moved a feral colony. It was, it was quite an undertaking when I did it. So I can only imagine. Yeah. And they were at that point, they were not feral to me. They were, they were my outside cats, basically. Um, and some of the neighbors were not appreciative of them. So I knew when we moved, I was going to move them with me. Um, so we did. We trapped them all and we moved them. And I was going to let them out because we have six acres in the woods here. Um, and I'm like, this is perfect. They can, you know, be happy outside cats. 
And while they were acclimating in my garage, I heard this weird noise outside one day and I was like, what is that? And I realized we have coyotes. And I was like, plan B, yeah. not outside now. So then we purchased a um, shed and I customized it to be a cat house. So they have a screened in porch and all kinds of stuff out there. That's really cool. I know you just never know what's living in the woods. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd never heard coyotes before. So it took me like some searching because coyotes never like popped into my head. Um, and then I realized what it was and I was like, oh, and they eat cats. So yeah, <laughs> no, no, not. Yes. Oh my but. goodness. Well, the, um, it always it boggles my mind. And my husband constantly reminds me that there was a point where I didn't know what I know now. And there are so many people that don't know what I know. And the idea that people are so they just want these outdoor cats gone like you said when you were moving they just don't want them there but the reality is that that's they're there for a reason and if you remove them more cats are just going to come in because it's a good place to live obviously that's why they're there <laughs> yeah and like we had yard molds and one of the outside cats I swear, single-handedly, she, like, removed the yard moles. And I was like, you know, I'm interested to see what's going to happen rodent-wise once we move those cats out. Like, the neighbors are going to be, you know what? We're seeing a lot more mice now. And, you know, our yard's getting torn up by yard moles. And I'm like, then they're going to realize the benefits. And I'm not... We bought this house. It came with an outside cat and it stressed me to no end about him being outdoors, but he did not want to be indoors at all. And so, you know, I'm not, I do know that cats live longer and happier indoors, but sometimes cats just, you know, there are cats that would rather be outdoors. Um, yeah. And those cat house cats, they had to acclimate to being confined in a way, you know, where they were used to. But now they're OK. And, you know, none of them try to escape when I go in They're You know, they're like, this is, this is kind of nice digs. It's OK. Um, but there are benefits to having an outside cat around. For sure. And. I, you know, a lot of those cats, I think that are just so used to living outdoors because that's all they've known, you know, moving inside is scary for them. And I, I love seeing those like videos on social media where it was like this cat absolutely was, did not want to come inside, but they were old, you know, getting older, maybe they got sick, maybe they got injured and they were brought inside and eventually is like, they're like living the life, right? And they're like, <laughs> yeah. they're like, wait a minute, is this what we've been missing? Like, we're warm, we're dry, we get pets, we get treats. This is kind of nice. Um, and you know, you're right about those outside cats who have never been, you know, inside. How it's an adjustment. Um, but I think that you you can run across the feral cats outside. Um, and then you run across those kind of, you can call them semi-feral. And I think it's wonderful that there's these organizations out there that are starting up like barn cat programs, working cat programs um, for cats who don't want to be inside, but aren't necessarily feral, giving them like a purpose and a place to stay where they have caretakers, you know, and mm -hmm. they're safe. Um, those are awesome programs. They're just, you know, kind of helps eliminate the overpopulation that we're having with the cats, unfortunately. It, yeah, it is really sad. I know one of my cats, I 
often talk about him as like he he still thinks he's a street cat <laughs> he lived as far as i can tell about the first five years of his life outdoors i took care of him in a feral colony for about three three and a half years um and i named him romeo because when i trapped him to get him neutered he was just the sweetest thing and like where whereas all the other cats would be like you know trying to plaster themselves up against the back wall when i opened the cages or whatever it was he was like rubbing on me <laughs> um he was so so sweet so i named him romeo but um and then when we moved to california many years ago i said that's it there were only two cats left in my feral colony that i had relocated and i said that's it you boys are coming inside when we move and they did and so he's acclimated really really well to being in, an indoor cat but he still will like act out sometimes uh, yeah <laughs> and especially if i'm trying to if I'm, I'm petting him in a way he doesn't like or he just gets tired of or if i try if i have to give him any medication um, or if I'm trying to check his teeth or ears, or even if I'm brushing him, a lot of times he's just like, bah, bah, like, he's just yeah. like that street cat comes out in him. Yeah. He's like, absolutely not. Back to his roots. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, you know, I still got it in me, mom. Um, yes, for sure. And he's, you know, he's 15 now, best we can tell 15. And so, you know, there are coming there there's just more and more times where it's like i need to check you more often i need to care for you a little more he's on a medication now and it's just like a you know this thing where like this is just something else we have to learn buddy <laughs> we have to <laughs> figure it out and i've because i've never like i you know i'm always hands-on with my cats and pet them a lot um but i've never really messed with their ears or their mouth or anything like that until recently because you know once again once you know better you start doing better um and so my older cats are like what in the world are you doing to me um so i have the two little gremlin kittens that i trapped at my school last easter that turned into foster fails um and I've started with them. I mess with their mouths. I check their ears. I rub their paws. And they're, you know, they're getting better. But at first they were kind of like, whoa, what, what are you doing? Um, but yeah, my older cats, you know, they're just, they're difficult to do because they get freaked out because they're not used to it. And they're like, why, why are you doing this to me? Um, so I realized, yeah, you got to start doing those things early get them used to it. For sure. So um, I know you're doing a lot of rescue work, a lot of TNR work. Can you kind of talk a little bit about what that is and what you do? Yeah. So TNR is trap, neuter, return. Um, and it's, it's basically done with feral cats um, to help stop the overpopulation. Um, I got started with it about, oh, over five years ago with that outside colony. Um, it started with one mom that strayed up and she was pregnant. She had the babies. She brought the babies to me when they were ready to be weaned. Um, and then she left. And so now I'm stuck with four feral kittens. Um, and I knew about, you know, I needed to get spay and neutered you know, even though they're outside, but I knew nothing about TNR. And I'm like, how am I supposed to get these four feral kittens to the vet? Like, how, how does this even work? Um, then the two females landed up having kittens and I'm like, okay, this is getting out of control now. Like, this is insane. Um, and so that's when I found out about TNR. So over um, the next few months, I started trapping them and getting them spayed and neutered. Um, and they all will have a little left ear tip, mm -hmm. um, which is the universal sign that that cat has a caregiver and has been spayed and neutered or vaccinated. Um, 
So then I started like realizing what an amazing program this is. Um, so I started volunteering with the organization. It's called Feral Cat Assistance Program in Greensboro. And like I said, it's been over five years. I now teach the trap class. Um, so I teach trap class once a month. And we are, we do two clinics occasionally, but we're clinic every month at the beginning of the month and it's low cost. So it's $10 to spay and neuter the cat. Um, they get vaccinated, they get the ear tip, they get flea and, you know, medication, pain medication. Um, and yeah, it's an amazing, amazing program. Um, they've been doing it for 25 years now. And last month we did two clinics and we probably did close to 160 cats. Wow. So, yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. It's, incredible. It, it saddens me that there's still mm -hmm. this many cats out there. I don't, I don't understand it. I don't, I don't know. Um, I think we need to have more like facilities that actually do low cost. Um, mm -hmm. Once a month isn't enough. And, you know, there's an organization in New York, Flatbush Cats, and they're actually in the process of building a facility that is going to be dedicated to low cost spay and neuter and veterinary care because it's just i don't understand why there's more cats running around than dogs it's a little i don't i don't know i haven't quite figured out what the difference is why you don't see like feral dogs running around but you see feral cats i'm i'm not sure i don't know but yeah it's it, it is um I think a difficult thing to get your mind around, but I, I imagine it, it has something to do with the fact that just in general in our society, people, people just treat dogs and cats differently. They, they look, you know, it's very common to see people treat their dogs as family and cats are like a transient kind of, oh, they're cute, but they're fine to live outdoors. Kind of like I could never, I never ever could think that way, but I see that in our society, you know, yeah. and, and not getting them the same level of care. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it is very interesting. Yeah. And I guess it's because, I mean, you know, growing up, my grandparents had, they lived in the country and they had outside cats. And they had dogs and the dog stayed inside and they had one cat that stayed inside. Um, but the outside cats, you know, they were, I mean, well fed and, you know, taken care of, but they didn't go to the vet and they surely didn't get them spay and neutered. So then there was lots of, you know, cats having cats having cats. And then eventually you got cats with, you know, deformities because, there's, you know, inbreeding happening and it's just, but I think there was that mindset that they're cats, they're outside. So we don't need to care for them like mm -hmm. we would do or inside pets. And, um, it's just, you know, turned into a vicious cycle, but yeah. And you're right about that. For some reason you see so much more out there, like aimed towards dogs mm -hmm. than you do cats. Um, and I've noticed a shift just over the past couple of years that there's a lot more happening on the cat side. Um, and it's nice, but yeah, it's still, you know, you look for things and you can find all kinds of things for dogs, but. Yeah. I think dogs. that, you know, if we can find any positivity out of social media, because it's a really negative place in general. It, it could possibly be the awareness and this education uh, around cats as pets um, because, you know, there are so many creator accounts that are dog and cat focused, like they are the star of <laughs> the account. And I think when you, when these people see cats in the same way they, that, that they see dogs, 
being represented on social media, it kind of changes like our mind a little bit as to like, oh, wait, like they're the same. Like they're not the same. They're not the same species, but you know what I mean? Like they are uh, yeah. to be cared yeah. for and part of the family. And I think, I think if anything, that is actually something positive <laughs> about social media. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny because I think there's such that big misconception about cats anyways. Um, that they're, you know, aloof and they don't know how to show love and, you know, they don't need the same things that a dog needs. Um, and I find it so interesting because I've had dogs too. Um, I've always had cats and dogs at the same time. It's just been in the past, oh, maybe four years since our last dog passed away that I was just like, okay. I don't have time for a dog. Like, and, you know, and in some way cats are easier, you know, like I don't have to take the cats outside. Um, I don't have to take them for a walk, but in other ways, they're actually more complicated um, because their, their bodies are so like different than dogs. Um, and it's taken me some time to realize what I needed to give them to be happy and healthy. Um, and you know, now I'm like, God, life was so much easier when I could just like put a scoop of kibble in a bowl and go about my business, you know, give them that yeah. all day buffet of kibble. Um, but then I think, was it really easier? Because you think back and I'm like, I was taking the cats to the vet a lot because they were sick and couldn't figure out what was going on with them. And, you know. Um, once I started feeding them raw, because I'm a huge advocate for raw fed diet, um, and I noticed a huge difference in them. And I'm like, oh, my God. And then everything started clicking. Like, it all started making sense. And I'm like, wait a minute. Okay. So, yeah. I think you might also be the only other person I've ever met to say that because I have I have said that to Jay and Adrian, and they were like, oh my God. And I, I've said it to Pam and I've said it to Julie Ann. And I was like, cats are more difficult than dogs. They just are. And they're like, how dare you? <laughs> I'm like, they are. <laughs> they are. They are seriously. They're so like intricate. Yeah. Like, and they're so individual personalities. Like, you know, it's, it's different if you have like one or two cats, you know, it's, it can be pretty easy. Um, but when you have multiple, multiple cats, it really does get difficult. Um, you know, I have some who only wants to eat chicken. So I got to make sure that they always get their chicken raw. Because that's the only thing. And God forbid if one of the other cats tries to eat their chicken raw, then it's, you know, it turns into insanity. And then supplements, I give them their supplements. And some cats have to have this supplement. Some cats have to have this supplement. You know, it's, it's just, and they're spiritual and mental, emotional too, you know. I mean, some cats want horizontal scratchers. Some cats want vertical scratchers. Um, so, you know, it turns into like a challenge. And I mean, I guess that's only because I'm taking the initiative mm -hmm. to see what works for them and do what needs to be done to make them happy. Um, whereas, you know, there may be other people that are like, this is what they get and that's it. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, I've definitely found like this, like ebb and flow of like, there are times when one of them decides they don't want to eat X, Y, and Z anymore. And so because they are now being really finicky, another one of the cats is like, well, I'm going to be finicky too. And then I wind up with all four because I only have four right now. All four of my cats are like, no, like, they're just being so fickle about everything. And it's like, I find myself like, balled up on the floor crying, like, please stop. I can't take us anymore. <laughs> and then there are times when everything is going great and they're all like, 
good and eating what they're supposed to be eating and taking their supplements. And other times it's like, you're out of your mind. I'm not taking that pill today. (laughs) And, you know, and it's so funny because I'm like, why, why are y'all this way? And then I go into, okay, is there something wrong with you? Like, Mm -hmm. like, is there a reason why you're not eating that? Yeah. You, You loved it. Now, why aren't you eating it? You know, and it may just be that, you know, I'm just not feeling the turkey today. So, Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it's just, but my mind automatically goes to, okay, you're acting abnormal. What's wrong? wrong? Yeah. Yeah. So then I'm, you know, trying to play detective and then I'm little box stalking and making sure that everything's okay there. And it's just, yeah. And my husband is just like, oh my gosh, what in the world? And I'm like, (laughs) Just let me be. I know. I know. And I so my cats, this this is actually the fewest cats I've had since I was in my early twenties. I think the most I ever had you definitely have me beat. I think the most I ever had between indoors and outdoors, because I had that feral colony for a while, was between fourteen and sixteen. Indoors, I think the most I ever had was ten. And then, so now I'm down to four and two of them are 14 and two of them are 15. Oh, and it's wow. just like, they were sadly, all of them, because I don't have any kittens, they've all been through everything with me. They have, they started out their life eating kibble. They started out their life getting annual vaccinations. They started out getting the topical flea. You know what I mean? So like, I think they are much healthier than some of my previous cats that hit this age, but I'm still starting to see the effects right. of, you know, their, their entire life hasn't been holistic, uh, holistically minded and just starting to see some of those effects as they age is kind of daunting, I think, especially because I know in my mind, I'm like, this is very possibly because I didn't start you out right. Like, you know, that guilt that we have in the back of our minds yep. that um, we we didn't have it right at first. And of course, we never really have it right. We're always trying to do better constantly, but it is, it is, it is a very daunting task these days. (laughs) I can't Uh, imagine 18. It's, you know, so Emmett and Zazzles and the other Kraken Kitties, they turned five yesterday. Um, And Emmett, since he was about a year old, has had health issues that we're not 100% sure what is going on. Um, for about two years, we thought he had FIP. Then we realized, no, he doesn't have FIP. Um, then he was doing good and he was on prednisone and we weaned him off of the prednisone. And then last April, he started getting sick again. And they realized he had a mass in his GI tract. So they thought it was cancer, not cancer. Couldn't figure out what it was. Um, the mass is gone. The vet can't feel it anymore. And he goes monthly now for appointments to keep a check on it. And he's gained, he's almost 14 pounds now when at the time he was only nine, um, last April. So he's gained quite a bit of weight, Yeah. but did, um, had Pam, Russell from Perfectly Holistic, um, do some muscle testing on him. And she got glyphosate toxicity. So I brought it to my vet. And luckily, I have a new vet now who is completely open to my holistic approach. Um, And she was like, I've never heard of that. Let me look and see. So she researches and she finds the test. And she said, "Okay." so we ordered the test. Um, Sure enough. He had high levels of glyphosate toxicity. And so then she's like, okay, what does this mean? Like, how does, what, what do we do? So then she finds like this page of six. Pro- <laughs> 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 
<laughs> That's right. She finds this page of holistic approaches to treat glyphosate toxicity. Um, and what it boiled down to is the three years of his life that he was being fed kibble was what caused this. Um, and so, you know, I find myself going, oh my gosh, I cannot believe that what I thought, and they weren't eating like the cheap kibble. I was buying them the really good expensive wow. kibble. And, you know, and that frustrated me so bad. Like I was like, this isn't even fair. Like, you know, these pet food companies tried to mislead the customers and I'm just, it, it just irritates me. So um, I'm very much, my cat, my soul cat passed away two years ago from kidney disease. He was only four. And it came from, it came from the kibble and over vaccination. So, you know, that was what prompted me to start blogging. Yes. So, so really quickly, before we talk a little bit about your blog, um, by the time this episode airs, the episode with Susan Thixton will have aired. So mm -hmm. when Laura Lee is talking about the detrimental side effects of feeding a highly processed rendered diet that we know as kibble. Uh, if that is something new to you, please go back and listen to the episode with Susan Thixton because she is, I think, one of the well, it's definitely the best consumer advocate that we have for our pets um, in in the pet food industry, <laughs> uh, but also one of one of the best sources of knowledge. Her blog, truthaboutpetfood.com, um, is very eye opening and very enlightening. If that is something that is new to you that you have not heard of before, please go check that out. So, Laura Lee, I am so thankful that there are more and more people like you who are advocating for our cats. And you recently started a blog, which you just talked about, the dedicated feline enthusiast. I got it right that time. <laughs> uh, so tell me a little bit about your blog and why you started it and what kind of uh, topics you cover. So it's been about a year now. A um, little over a year, I started it, and um, it came out because my sister was in school for IT, and she was in a class, and she was she had to create a portfolio, and she was like, "I'll create you a website. You just got to tell me what kind of website." And I'm like, "Okay, let me think about it." And at first, I I'm certified in animal reiki. When Monty got sick with kidney disease, I had a friend who was coming over and she was doing Reiki on him and I saw the benefits of it. Um, so I went ahead and got certified myself so I could do it when she wasn't able to come. Um, and I was going to do an animal Reiki site, but it just wasn't, it wasn't ringing with me. Um, I, it just didn't resonate that that's what I was supposed to do. And it was actually on one of the team crazy cat ladies, um, VIP Zoom. And Adrian had said something to one of the members about following your passion. And for some reason that resonated with me. And when I went to bed, I was thinking about it. And when I woke up the next morning, the dedicated feline enthusiast was like in my head. Um, and blogging. So I called my sister and I'm like, this is what I want to do. And I'm like, there needs to be more out there. Um, because I'm an English teacher, I love to learn. Um, I love to research. I love to go down rabbit holes and find out and then simplify it 
for people. Um, so that's basically what I do. I kind of use my personal experience because with 18 cats, there's plenty of personal experience. Um, and my topics range from supplements to raw food, um, to using color therapy, um, muscle testing, animal communication, um, herb gardens, how to safely use essential oils and hydrosols with your cats, um, how our energy affects our cats, things that people may not think about or know about, um, I bring it to them with hopefully some humor attached to because once again, with 18 cats, there's <laughs> lots going on. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> uh, well, I'm so glad that you are doing this and putting more content out there for people to consume about how to better care for their cats. Um, I My ears especially perked up at the essential oils. Um, I have to, that, that is like, I have a lot of pet peeves when it comes to what people know and what they don't know and what misconceptions are floating around the internet about our pets. Um, and this idea that all essential oils are toxic to our cats, it drives me literally up the wall because it's like, what do you think that, like, do you think they're avoiding every single plant in the world as they are, you know, wandering around wild outdoor, like how, this, it makes literally no sense to me, but I think it really come, stems from the fact that people don't understand um, that not all essential oils are created equal and there's a lot of fragrances being masqueraded as essential oils and not understanding the differences because um, it's really all about quality. And I, I would say like one of the biggest things that people harp on on my YouTube channel specifically, I am constantly getting people talking about you can't use citrus oils around your cat. And I'm like, you're at it like you're you're crazy. Like, I, I mean, I don't know how many times I pulled out my ADR and I'm like, look, <laughs> you know, well, good. and so I have always been more of a holistic approach in my care. Um, I've always, you know, would much rather use natural cleaners that, excuse me, bleach and Lysol and all of that. It's just, you know, been that way. And it's only been in the past couple of years that I've made that connection that what I do for myself, I can actually do for <laughs> my cats. Yeah. Um, so I was a big in essential oils. And then I heard, oh, essential oils are bad. They're bad for cats. You know, they could kill your cat. So then I like stopped. There was no essential oils being used in my house at all. And it wasn't until I was introduced to Julianne Thorne um, from Naturally Cats. And I purchased her book and started reading. And it was like, wait a minute, I can use essential oils and hydro like what in the world? And it's all about self-selection um, and, you know, using them safely. You don't take the citrus oil and rub it all on your cat. You don't, mm -hmm. there, that's where it's different from dogs. You've got to allow the cat to choose, to self-select what they need. Um, and also, you know, make sure it's a well-ventilated room and they have the ability to leave the room if that's not what they're needing. But cats are not stupid. They know, they are very intelligent. And they'll know exactly what they need. Um, I use hydrosols to help ease the tension among three of the cats right now. And I've been using frankincense, chamomile, and peppermint. And I always put them down on fabric. So that way, you know, if it spills, it's not over on the floor. But I put them in different areas. So that way it's, you know, different places, easy, accessible, easy to get away from the others if they come up. And for some reason, no matter where I put the chamomile, 
Zazzles will go and he'll drink the hydrosol water. I mean, you know, there's a reason why he's doing that. You know, none of the other cats have attempted to drink that, but Zazzles will. So there's a reason why he needs that chamomile hydrosol. Um, it's the same thing when I put down the herb gardens. I don't know how many herb gardens I've put down since I learned about them. And it still amazes me to watch them go and self-select the herbs mm -hmm. that they need. It's the most fascinating. It's just, I'm always like in awe. Like, I'm like, man. And they'll even tell me before I even get them out of the package. I now just lay the packages down and let them choose. What which, you put down, yeah. Yeah, which ones they get in their gardens. That's awesome. I know. It's like, you know, we, the body knows and our cats, I think are so much more in tune to what they need than we are. So it's harder for us to understand that that's what they're doing, but that's absolutely what they're doing. And, um, nature provides that's yeah. my, like, you know, the more and more I learn, it's like everything we need is provided yeah, in nature. You know? And I have always said that. I mean, you know, my husband laughs at me and I'm like, you know, before we domesticated the cat, um, they were thriving outdoors. Why? Mm -hmm. Like, how were they thriving? They were thriving better than dogs were outside in the wild. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, mm -hmm. they they had everything that they needed out there. And then when we bring them in, we completely remove them from everything that they need to be healthy. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we, we make them eat things like processed food and, you know, um, have no mental and, you know, stimulation, you know, expect them to sleep. And then we wonder why they get sick all the time. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think, I think in a way it's like going back to the basics, mm -hmm. you know, sure. if, we, if we just go back to how they survived and thrived in the wild and provide that for them in a safe indoor environment, then, you know, they're getting the best of both worlds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, that my husband is like that too. He calls me a witch. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, well, if this is what you think a witch is, then I'm going to take that as a compliment. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and it's funny because you know, my husband does that to me also. He calls it my woo woo, um, yeah. woo woo stuff. And out of my 18 cats, 15 of them are black. So, you know, there's that, that stereotypical witch going yeah. on here with yeah. all of my black cats. <laughs> um, but. It's Funny, my, I asked my husband, so my husband cooks, I don't cook. And um, so I asked him the other day, I was like, do we have clove? Because I saw a, a toothpaste recipe for me. And I was like, oh my gosh, I want to, I want to try that because I'm, I stress over the weirdest things. I stress over like to toothpaste because I, I don't want fluoride and I don't like, but I want <laughs> to protect my teeth. And I want, like, I have sensitive teeth. Blah, blah, blah. So I stress over weird things. And, um, so he was like, why do you need clove? And I'm like, I saw a toothpaste recipe. And he was like, of course you did. <laughs> like, I don't even question anymore. <laughs> like, I don't know why I asked. <laughs> you know, it's my husband's the same way. Like I'll say something and, uh, you know, I'll be like, Oh, so when we go to the store today, I need to find some red fabric. And he was like, okay, why? And I'm like, because I really think Bodhi's root chakra is blocked and he needs some red. And he's like, I have no idea what you're talking about, but if you need red fabric, we'll go and get red fabric. Like that's, yes. yeah, he's just, you know, um, and he's now learned to not second guess me because usually, mm -hmm. you know, like my kitty senses will start tingling and I'm like, I, I think something's wrong with Emmett. I'm going to take him to the vet. And he's like, he seems to be active fine to me. And I'm like, mm, no, something's not right. And then I take him and they're like, yeah, you know, he's got this or this. And he's like, how did you know that? And I'm like, kitty senses. Don't know what to tell you. 
Like, yeah. So he's learned now, you know, if I say something, just go with it. Just, mm-hmm. just go with it. Yeah. Yeah. My husband, that's like exactly the what my husband says too. Cause there have been many times years ago where I'd be like, I really feel like I need to take so and so to the vet. And he's like, What? Like, you spend so much money at the vet. Why do you keep going to the vet? And I'm like, I just, there's something off. Right. And sure enough, there will be like a UTI or an ear infection yep. or something going on. And I'm like, I know. I just, like, I could tell there's yep. just something off. They're not walking right. They're not acting right. They're not eating right. They're not, you know what I mean? Like there's something you just know. And that's what my husband says now. He's like, if you think we need to go, then we need to go. Cause. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And he knows that it's not like, I'm not going to run to the vet just for anything. Like if I'm taking them to the vet, there's, there's something. Um, and it was funny. He said something about the not walking right. Um, because one of the kittens, I was like, is she walking funny? And he's like, no, she's walking. I'm like, no, no, nope. look at her left paw. She's walking funny. He's like, mm-hmm. I'm not seeing it. And so the next day she was doing it still. And I'm like, mm, no, she's going to the vet. Um, and took her to the vet. And sure enough, she had a little pulled tendon because, you know, she was a kitten and they think they can fly. Yes. <laughs> Um, and she jumped off of something and she landed wrong. Um, and she pulled a little tendon and he was like, I swear, how did you even notice? And I'm like, (laughs) it's, you know, I don't know if I'm just so in tune with my cats that I know, like if, you know, if they walk funny or if they're not eating something or, you know, if they sleep in a different place, Mm -hmm. a completely abnormal, never before, that's always sends up a red flag for me. Kind of like, okay, wait a minute. And then I start watching and seeing if there's Mm -hmm. any other kind of signs, you know? Um, Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's, you know, I'm in tune. Yeah. Yeah, I completely agree. And um, so I hope that, for you listening, you know that there is so much more that we can be doing, not at the vet's office, not with pharmaceuticals, but like, this is all free. Just connect with your pet. And a lot of times they're, they're telling you things you are not hearing. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Oh, they are communicating all the time. Um, You just got to you just got to listen to what they're saying. And sometimes they're actually, sometimes they're actually communicating, communicating. Yeah. Um, there's been times that I've heard things and I'm like, okay, am I hearing voices in my head? Like what in the world? And come to find out, like it was something from one of them, you know, um, Emmett told me he didn't need catalyst anymore. And I went to Pam and she muscle test and she said, nope, he doesn't need it anymore. And I'm like, all right, he, he kind of, he kind of told me, but I, you know, just needed to make sure. So, but yeah, just, you know, there's a lot of resources out there now on like how to do slight improvements Mm -hmm. in your pet's life. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, I've done articles on how to, add raw to your pet's diet. Like if you aren't willing or can't switch over to a raw diet, there's ways to, to get around it, you know, um, adding some freeze dried crushed up on top or, you know, adding some bone broth to that kibble, um, pet appropriate bone broth, not the bone broth you can find in the grocery store. Um, but, you know, doing things like that. Um, and it's amazing how food can eliminate issues just as mm-hmm. fast as food can create issues. Mm-hmm. Zazzles had severe anemia um, in October, so bad that we thought he was going to need a blood transfusion. Oh, wow. Um, and he was at the vet Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday. And I had to pick him up Tuesday afternoon because the vet's office was going to be closed on Wednesday. 
And my vet told me afterwards that she did not expect me to bring him back on Thursday. And when I brought him home Tuesday, I started feeding him freeze dried beef liver mm -hmm. because his iron's low. Yep. What's the best thing to give someone who has low iron? Right. Yep. Um, so I started giving him that and he, I started him on small amounts of raw food um, and supplements. He started getting um, supplements from the two crazy cat ladies, got B12 and Oxycat and Catalyst two, three times a day. And when I brought him back on Thursday, she was amazed that he came back and his levels had started to normalize. And by Friday, she was like, he's not going to need a blood transfusion. I don't know what you did, but keep doing it. Yeah. So. I'm glad you mentioned the supplements too, because sometimes I think the anemia can be not necessarily due to a lack of receiving nutrients, but a lack of being able to properly digest and utilize those nutrients and those specific supplements that you're giving or that you were giving him were helping with digestion as well. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of an important side note. That's the, that that's the pet health coach in me. <laughs> And, you know, and it's, and it's funny because I have like, I've dabbled in so much. Um, and I've thought about, you know, going like the route you went, um, and doing like pet health or, um, maybe, you know, going into more of the woo woo and I've taken, um, Pam Russell's muscle testing workshop. And so I've got that and I've taken color therapy workshop and chakra cat chakra course with Julianne Thorne. And, you know, I'm in the process of doing an animal communication course, but I don't, I don't want to, it's almost like I don't want to almost like pigeonhole myself into one. I like knowing a little bit about everything, you know, mm -hmm. um, and if I need to going further into a topic. Um, but I do like having that kind of like Jack of all trades, mm -hmm. <laughs> none added <attitude laughs> on. <hon. laughs> so, um, but yeah. And I kind of think of my cats as like my guinea pigs. And, yeah. um, I, let's see if this color therapy actually does work. Um, and when it does work, I'm like, okay, all right. And here we go. Here's an article about color therapy. So my cats are my motivation for, um, and my inspiration for my articles. Yeah. I think that's the best way to go about it instead of, you know, just writing hypotheticals is to actually express to people what you have experienced is so much more valuable. Yeah. And I think that's the appeal too, is that it's not just, you know, like a vet talking about something or, you know, it's, it's a real person with real life experience. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So where can people find you and where can they read all of these wonderful blogs? Um, so the website is www.the D F E. So T H E D F E dot com. Um, I made it easier for the website instead of yeah. spelling out the dedicated feline enthusiast. Yeah. Um, the Facebook and Instagram pages, unfortunately, are the dedicated feline enthusiasts. Um, but if you go to the website, there's links to all of the social media on there. So perfect. Yeah. Well, I hope you give. At Laura Lee, a follow, check out her blog at, it's the dedicated feline enthusiast, but it's at the DFE.com. And thank you so much for joining us today, Laura Lee. And um, I hope to see so much more wonderful stuff from you in the future. Thank you for having me.
Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. Make sure that you're following the show so you never miss an episode. And please take a moment to rate the show on your podcast app. I'd also love it if you'd share this podcast with your friends and family so that they can benefit from the information to help their pets live long, happy lives too. Don't forget to take advantage of this special discount as a listener today and get access to over 100 online videos and my online dog training, The Furry Family Coach. Just go to thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code PODCAST at checkout to get your first month for only $7. That's thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code PODCAST at checkout to get your first month for only $7. I can't wait to have you join and see you on the inside. Oh, oh, oh.